Well, how is the hole in your heart doing? Now, if you were not here last week, you're saying, what are you talking about? James asked us that question. Last week, James talked about uh, he and Karen, who just read their, their daughter, Anna, and how she had had a hole in her heart that was repaired. He even showed us a picture of that repaired heart, which was very memorable. And uh, James talked a lot about feelings, things like anger and sadness and anxiety, and, and how we medicate with hyper-consumerism and hyper-individualism. The gospel of self as God. The gospel of self-fulfillment. And, and James talked about how, in contrast, the gospel of Jesus is a gospel of self-sacrifice. And as I reflected on the message last week, and I even re-listened to it, I, uh, I, I thought, man, this was so good, but, but, but wait a minute. How did we get to feelings from the text? I, I remember thinking that when I was initially listening. How, why are we talking so deeply about feelings? But then I, I remembered how the chapter begins. Look at how it begins in verse 1. Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He's an angry dude. Very angry. And, and James showed us the feelings chart, right? And, and I went through the anger one, and there's at least five of these that, that Peter, or sorry, uh, Saul definitely has. He's very, very angry. I mean, does, does breathing out murderous threats sound to you like someone who's generally upbeat, well-adjusted, and sees the cup half full? No. And we appropriately heard that we don't know all the feelings that Paul might have had. We don't. But check out Paul's self-description here on the screen in 1 Timothy 3, verse 1. He says, I was a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man. He was a violent, angry man. Now, we've all heard the expression, you can read too much into a story. And for sure, you can. But I don't think it's a stretch to say that it's not too much to read into this story, that, that Paul was a very angry man. And we've probably all heard this expression that hurt people hurt people. And I think this applies to Saul. He likely was a very hurting individual. And so he was out hurting people. Saul had a hole in his heart. We all do. We all do. And it manifests a couple of ways. And last week, we, we really emphasized one of those. And that is a sinful heart. We all have a hole in our heart because we have a sinful heart. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. But we also have a hole in our heart because many of us have a broken heart. But both of those represent a hurting heart and maybe even a hard heart. Karen and I have a neighbor uh, that just moved in next door about three years ago, uh, he and his wife. His name is Nick, and I call him Neighbor Nick. And uh, Neighbor Nick has an interesting story. He's a Greek fellow, came to faith in Christ at the University of Waterloo through outreach to students. And then God called him and his wife to Spain, and he was a missionary in Spain for nine years. Uh, there was some time in between, but then they were in Spain for nine years. And then sadly, his wife uh, got a disease and went home to heaven. And so he was now a father of a 15-year-old and a 6-year-old, two, two boys. And uh, eventually, he found his way back to Waterloo, and he was a pastor in Waterloo for five years. And then about a decade ago, he started to move into uh, psychotherapy, and so now he's a registered psychotherapist. And he and his wife, as I said, moved in about three years ago. Well, I have the privilege from time to time to go for motorcycle rides with Nick. We love motorcycling together. And we enjoy bouncing on a mini trampoline. Not together, but, but we <laughs> both do. And we enjoy walks from time to time. And I call them noontime walks with neighbor Nick. And I'll tell you, when I go on these noontime walks with neighbor Nick, it's mind-blowing. He says, that, like one of the times we're walking and we're talking about a sinful heart, and this is what he said. The cross heals a sinful heart because it was sin that made it sinful. 
I said, okay, let's keep walking. Unpack that for me. The cross heals a sinful heart because it was sin that makes it sinful. It, yeah, it's, it's the love of God. It's the forgiveness of God, the grace of God that forgives and, and repairs the hole in her heart that was caused because of sin. Do you and I have a sinful heart? Do we have a sinful heart? Um, we have talked, Harry and I have both talked about a pastor named Pavlo in the Ukraine. And actually this coming Wednesday, we get to have another Zoom meeting live with, with Pastor Pavlo. So looking forward to that. But just this past week, he wrote in, a, in an update letter that he and his team visited Bucha and Erpine. And this is what he said. This is word for word. I haven't changed a thing. It was very impactful for me to see with my own eyes the damage and consequences of Russian aggression. To see hundreds of buildings destroyed, hundreds of cars shot, burned, torn apart by Russian guns and bombs, and so many lives lost in them. The ugliness of sin, of human pride and aggression is still with us. This war is a grotesque form of it, but sadly, now I enlarged this and highlighted it, but sadly, the root that caused it is in all our hearts. And this shows again how much we need Jesus and the resurrection of heart that he gives. Also seeing all that, I can now pray with more understanding, let your kingdom come, let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We desperately need it. Amen. We all have a sinful heart. Well, how does the cross heal a sinful heart? Well, it's through the truth about God that we learn. It's the doctrine of God and of salvation. It's, it's the theology around grace and, and mercy. And what does it mean to be justified and made right by faith and forgiveness by means of Jesus shed blood? Jesus did not come to make bad hearts good. He came to bring dead hearts back to life. In the language of scripture, to give us a new heart, a heart transplant, that's what we needed. And that's all true. And so in our noontime walk with Nick, neighbor Nick, he told me about that. But then he said this. He said, let's talk about a broken heart, though. Love heals a broken heart because it was unloving that broke it. And when he said that, I said, neighbor Nick, can we walk for another hour? You have to explain that one. Love heals a broken heart because it was unloving that broke it. Hey, you know what? We probably need to say, could everyone turn their phones off? Would that be okay? They'll still vibrate, but we had about three go off last week. So if you wouldn't mind, that'd be great. Yeah, so, so unloving broke it. Now, last week, James talked about this, but, but neighbor Nick also talked about this, how, how that we're like an iceberg. And the presenting issue, the above the water stuff is things like what's on the screen, anxiety and depression and anger and fear and relational issues and addictions. But below the surface is emotional, relational, trauma-related injury. Now, understand what that means. Something connected to someone was unloving. And that caused trauma and injury. I'm going to say that again. Something connected to someone was unloving toward us, and that caused trauma and injury. Now, Nick didn't say this, because what happens when I talk with Nick, I, I go home and I say, God, thank you for neighbor Nick. And now I'm going to do some research into the things he said, and I learn more things. And so this is one of the things I've learned, that trauma is not a mental injury. Sorry. Trauma is a mental injury. It is not a men mental illness. And more specifically, it's a soul injury. When I think of the soul, I think of M-E-W, mu, mind, emotions, will. Those are the things that get damaged. But here's the, the, the wonderful thing. Soul injury can be healed. Soul injury can be healed by truth and by love. We've all heard the expression, time heals old wounds. 
I really appreciate that Dr. Henry Cloud has updated that. He says, no, it's not just time that heals old wounds. It's truth plus time that heals old wounds. Well, neighbor Nick and I, we've updated it even further. We say that it's truth and love plus time that heals old wounds. Now, in case any of you are thinking, just, just time out for a moment. If you're thinking, am I the only one who's experienced the kind of trauma that I have? Well, in a sense, yes, we all have an individual journey. But there's a very real sense in which it is common to us all. It is almost impossible to to travel through the world and not experience some degree of emotional, relational trauma-related injury. One in eight kids grow up in a home where parents fight in unhealthy ways. One in eight. One in three women and one in five men, this is the most average statistic, one in three women and one in five men have been sexually assaulted sometime in their past. Poverty, discrimination, abusive religious school upbringings, How many stories are there out there like that? Moral and even natural evil can all injure and trigger a trauma response. But trauma does not have to be an extreme event. Any situation where you feel overwhelmed and unsafe can trigger a trauma response. And you say, what what is a trauma response? Anyone here take any physiology in school or biology? You probably heard a little bit about this. I I was actually training in university to become a chiropractor, not a pastor. And so my major was biology, my minor was psychology. And honestly, it was a worship experience to learn about the trauma response. That God gave us this fight, flight, or freeze response because he loves us. In a moment of threat, it's a short-term survival mode. And we could talk about the autonomic nervous system and adrenaline and cortisol and all that it does. But the beautiful thing is there's this sympathetic nervous system that ramps us up to protect us. And the parasympathetic counterbalancing system that brings us back down. It's all God's amazing care for his creation. But here's the thing. When that trauma-related injury keeps getting triggered in our body repeatedly, and we experience episodes of activation and activation and activation, it leads to all kinds of unhealthy side effects, even illnesses in our body. Back to neighbor Nick. As he's unpacking this, he said, you know, Gord, there's pain and there's shame attached to that trauma-related injury. And that pain needs relief. That shame requires medication. And we medicate in all kinds of unhealthy ways. And last week, James talked a little bit about, you know, what is the go-to for you? And kind of the top big three, and, and they are alcohol, drugs, pornography. But you know the ones that we don't really count or we discount, but, but, but they certainly are a huge go-to for a lot of people, and that's things like work. We dive headlong into work to medicate our pain. Or food. Or pre- and post-pandemic socializing, just I have to be with people. Or how about this one? Noise. I just can't have silence. What do you think the number one go-to in North America is? Apparently, statistically, it's distraction. Amusement not thinking about it, not dealing with it. Why? Because a broken heart is beneath it all. So, neighbor Nick and I had this conversation. What do well-meaning Christians do, or what do we say, and what do most preachers do and say about it? Getting kind of personal when he went there, but uh, he said, I would actually like to gather every pastor I know in a room and tell them a a few things. See, what we, what we bring to it, again, is truth and doctrine and theology. 
And these all point in the right direction, but it doesn't heal a broken heart. In fact, neighbor Nick said this, and, and this, this is such a quotable thing he says, you can order water from the River Jordan, wash in it for a month, and it won't heal a broken heart. You can get hold of some olive oil from the Mount of Olives, put it in a diffuser, and breathe it in for weeks. It's not going to heal a broken heart. It is emotional, relational healing that is necessary. Now, you might be saying, you might be saying, this is relatively interesting, Gord, but what does it have to do with our text? And I'm glad you asked, because the answer is everything. Everything. There is a beautiful example of how healing from trauma-related injury can begin in our text. And just before we go there, I asked neighbor Nick, how, how do we get it? Like, how do we get that healing, and, and where do we get it? And you've got to tell me. And, and Gord said, or sorry, Nick said, Gord, how about next week when we go for our next walk? And I said, okay. So when I go for my walk with Nick, I'll tell you, okay? I'm kidding, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. The answer is in our passage. And as we read it, I want you to be watching for this. Notice, this is the answer that Nick said, is, is the way toward healing creating a safe space, being a safe person that makes a genuine connection. A genuine connection where a person can be real and can share their experience without being judged. In fact, look at this quote. The opposite of addiction is not so much sobriety as it is connection. The opposite of addiction is not so much sobriety as it is connection. Look at the screen. That blows my mind. It really does. As James said last week, heart repair, sorry, and heart surgery happens in community. So in our story, Jesus met Saul on the road of life, he revealed himself to Saul, but then Jesus sent him community in order to begin the healing journey from Saul to Paul. Listen, Jesus is the ultimate safe person. He is the ultimate safe person. And by design, he is the head of his body on earth, the church. Sorry, you've got to see that again, but I clicked it twice. Come on, get by there. Is it gone? Okay. His church is his body on earth. It is called disciple making and disciple maturing through others. It is not just commanded of his people, but it brings healing surgery to wounded, broken hearts. So let's have a look at the text. Now we're going to go back just a few verses. Verse 8 and 9. Saul got up from his experience, right, from the ground. But when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. For three days he was blind, and he did not eat or drink anything. Isn't it interesting that Saul's encounter with Jesus left him with a voluntary and an involuntary response? Involuntary, he was blind and totally unable to see for three days. That was not his choosing. But then voluntarily, he chose not to eat or drink for three days. Why? Because he had experienced trauma. You talk about a fight, flight, or freeze response to what he experienced on the road. And so as he's sitting there processing, this was a great gift to Paul or to Saul, that he could sit for three days in darkness and processed. But has it ever happened to you where something so big has occurred in your life that you literally lost your appetite? That's the kind of response that he's, he's going through. Now, Jesus could have filled Saul in on what was next in his life. But that's not generally how God works. He leads us, as he led Saul, into community to discover his will and, his, and our healing, to experience healing. So look at verse 10. In Damascus, there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision, Ananias. Yes, Lord, he answered. Isn't this interesting that he's a disciple? Just a disciple. 
He's not a preacher, as far as we know. He's not a teacher. He's not a pastor, an elder, a prophet. He's a disciple. He's an apprentice of Jesus. Can God use one of those? <laughs> yes. But, but wait, this is going to be the Apostle Paul, right? So God's certainly going to use a heavyweight disciple maker in this case. No, he's not. What was the key to Ananias' success here? The key was in these two words, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Can, can I suggest memorize those two words? Karen and I have made a commitment that we're going to pull by the roots a hundred dandelions a day. You know what a better goal is? Say yes, Lord, a hundred times a day. I, I, I'm serious. Make a commitment. <laughs> you may not count it, but, but, but when, when you're faced with whatever it is, thoughts, temptation, whatever is going on in your heart, yes, Lord. And we'll say no to a lot of things because we say yes to God. Um, I want to tell you a, a quick story. There are hundreds of of thousands of people on the earth today who are followers of Jesus because there is someone, someone who explained the gospel to them. And I'm going to tell you who that someone is in just a minute. But that someone met Jesus in a tent meeting in North Carolina when a preacher named Mordecai Ham was speaking one night. Well, why was Mordecai Ham preaching in a tent in North Carolina? Well, because some Christian businessmen in that town invited him to come and speak. Well, why did they do that? Because a preacher named Billy Sunday came and spoke to the Christian businessmen about how we needed the gospel outreach in our town. Well, why was Billy Sunday there? Because a guy named Wilbur Chapman, who was associated with the YMCA of the United States, said, you know what? The YMCA needs an evangelist on staff. And they hired Billy Sunday to be that staff person. Wilbur Chapman was turned on to live for God because of the preaching of a man named F.B. Meyer. F.B. Meyer came to faith because of the preaching of a preacher in Chicago named D.L. Moody. And someone led D.L. Moody to faith in Jesus. And I'm going to tell you who started that discipleship chain even before the great evangelist D.L. Moody. But who is the someone down below? Does anyone know? Billy Graham. And at the top, a disciple named Edward Kimball, a shoe salesman, and a Sunday school teacher. That's how it started. And the hero in the story is always Jesus. <laughs> is always Jesus. But isn't that amazing? He's just a disciple. That's who God wants to use, you and me just a disciple who says yes lord a hundred times a day verse 11 the lord told him so this is in a vision okay he's in in a vision ananias gets told go to the house of judas on straight street and, as opposed to crooked avenue i guess and ask for a man from tarsus named saul for he is praying well, good religious Jewish boy, of course he was praying. No, not like this. He was really praying. Bearing his soul to God. Probably saying things like, God, I thought I was in the center of your will in my violence and anger, and now I realize that I don't even know you. I'm just getting to know you. I want to know you. And he's bearing his soul in prayer. Verse 12, in a vision... In a vision, he has seen a man named... Na Wait a minute. This is a vision inside a vision. <laughs> right? Ananias is having a vision that Saul's having a vision. Wow, this is layers deep. This is like having a dream within a dream. Have you ever had a dream within a dream? I don't think I have. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias, that's me, come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Isn't this interesting? Saul here was physically unable to see, but spiritually he could see just fine. He was given a vision. 
I don't know about you, but Karen and I, in recent years, we have been praying overtime for our friends, many of our friends, to have dreams and visions. That God will give spiritual inquirers who are not even seeking him, who are spiritually blind, visions and dreams of Jesus. And I know there's someone here, and that's how you came to Jesus. You had a dream, and that was the beginning of your move toward him. Now, honestly, 13 and 14, there is, to me, a lot of humor. I love finding humor in the Bible, and there's definitely humor here. Look at this. He says, Lord, again, I'm in. You're king. I'm in. You're Lord. But then, it's almost like he says, Jesus, I do want to give you some information you may not be aware of. I need to fill you in on something. So Lord, Ananias answered, I have heard, I don't know if you've heard this, but I've heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem. And he has come, Lord, did you know this? He has come here with authority from the chief priests to arrest all who call on your name. Ananias likely knew or was aware that he was personally in the crosshairs of Saul. Saul's arrest list had names on it. If we scanned it, Ananias' name was probably on it. And maybe to be martyred for his witness about Jesus. So, can you imagine Ananias saying, Lord, now that you know, do you still want me to go? Look at, look at verse 15. But the Lord said to Ananias, go. <laughs> yeah, go. This man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. There are some keys. If you're taking notes, would you please write this down? There are some keys here in making and maturing disciples of Jesus. There's three in this verse. Number one, show up. Go. Show up. Go. More than half of the battle in disciple-making and disciple-maturing is showing up. Go. Number two, spend time with Jesus talking about the person you're on a journey with. Don't we see that here? He's speaking to Jesus, to the Lord, about the person that he's being sent to. So, So we need to do that. Spend time with Jesus talking about the person you're on a journey with. Number three, let Jesus speak to you about them. Jesus speaks about Saul's identity and destiny. He does that too. I, because of time, I'm not going to take the time, but, but we have had this experience where we have prayed and prayed and prayed for people, and God has given us a revelation of something that we could speak into their lives that did resonate with what their identity was in Christ and the vision that he had for them. And if we would spend time with Jesus, he will reveal some of these things to us. Well, look, we're going to see some more keys in just a minute. But look at verse 17. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Now, can I be honest? If I were Ananias, I would be entering the house leading with a few questions. I'd be saying, who are you? And Saul would answer, I'm Saul. And who am I? Well, you're Ananias. And tell me precisely what I'm going to do. Well, you're going to lay your hands on me and you're going to restore my sight. And how do you know this? Well, I saw it in a vision. All right, let's go over it again. Who are you? And I would want to know for sure that he saw the same vision that the Lord told me in my vision that he had seen. And this is a real thing. I'm making light of it a bit, but it's a real thing. In 2 Corinthians 11, the chapter where Paul talks about the incredible dangers that he's been through. I mean, we think about the cost of, of, of showing up, the cost of doing anything with the Lord and for Jesus, and, and, and we think, well, no, I can't do it. Read 2 Corinthians 11 and see what Paul went through, the dangers, the shipwrecks, the beatings, the illnesses, the near-death experiences. But then he says this, I was in danger from false believers. I remember just a few years ago in Turkey, a Christian group got infiltrated by people who pretended they were believers. And there's young people here, but they violated the sixth commandment. 
on those people. Those believers were sent to heaven. False believers. And so Paul, Saul, could have been infiltrating the Christian group at Damascus in order to martyr them. So, of course, there's concern. But notice, Ananias, on the strength of Jesus saying, go. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again, and notice, be filled with the Holy Spirit. So here's a few more keys to disciple making. A look, a word, a touch. A look, a word, a touch. And uh, I owe credit to um, Rick Warren in Purpose Driven Life. He talks about almost 100% of Jesus' encounters with people. Watch for it. There's a look, there's a word, and there's a touch. And certainly in this case with Ananias and Saul. W what's he doing? He he's creating a safe space. He's showing Saul that he's a safe person in order to make a genuine connection. A genuine connection. And this is going to begin a healing in Saul that's much deeper than his eyesight. In fact, look at the expression, brother Saul. Brother Saul. Saul. If you wonder how meaningful that was to Saul, years later in Acts 22, when Paul is recounting his story of meeting Jesus, listen to what he says. You don't need to turn to it. In, in Acts 22, my companions led me by the hand into Damascus because the brilliance of the light had blinded me. A man named Ananias came to see me. Isn't that beautiful? The ministry of presence was so meaningful to Paul. Years later, he came to see me. He was a now this is information about Ananias we weren't told before. He was a devout observer of the law and highly respected by all the Jews living there. In other words, he was on my short list. He stood beside me and said, Brother Saul. Isn't that beautiful? Years later. I remember that he came to see me. I remember he stood beside me. I remember what he called me. The first words. He called me his brother. That lit a fire in me. That I belonged. I belonged to the people that I had determined to kill. They received me. This is the love of God. This is the love of the Father. But notice this. He said, Brother Saul, receive your sight. At that very moment, I was able to, he doesn't say to see, I was able to see him. That's amazing. First thing I saw was my brother. You talk about relational connection with a safe person that began a healing. Listen, you and I, are desperately in need of this kind of connection. Jesus sends, and Jesus sends safe people into our lives in order to make a connection, in order for us to share our experience without being judged, in order to bring emotional, relational healing to us from trauma-related injury. Now, may I say this? For some injury, we need someone with a higher pay grade than just a disciple. We need a Nick or some trusted Jesus following counselor. We do. But may I say, please, please pursue this kind of relationship. Verse 18 and 19, immediately something like scales fell from Saul's eyes. I think even more fell from his heart. And he could see again. He got up and was baptized. And after taking some food, he regained his strength. I don't know if David and Linda Nellis are online, but I had a really great visit with them this past week. And David said, we got talking about this passage. And he said, you know what I love about this packet? passage? He ate after he got baptized. The guy was hungry. He hadn't eaten for three days, but he had his priorities straight. He got baptized. I thought, whoa, that is so good. I'm going to say that on Sunday. 
But it also gives us chapter and verse that it's biblical to have a special lunch after baptism. <laughs> Egg salad on brown, my personal favorite, after a baptism. Just saying. And funerals, that's true. But he's got his priorities right. He's already seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all other things. Physical needs will be given to you. Listen, I want to end with this. If you are medicating and numbing, and distracting, and escaping the pain and shame associated with your broken heart, and never going after it being healed, you're just passing it on to the next generation. You're just passing it on to the next generation. Get into community with people who love making disciples and maturing disciples. Next week, we're going to look at stage three, multiplying disciples. I want to be helpful, and so this truly is my closing with three questions in order to be helpful. Very quickly, these are three questions to ask and to engage someone you are mentoring. Someone that you are journeying with in their healing. And, and, and that's this. When you meet with them, ask the question, how's your heart? How is your soul? It, it, it's deeper than how are you and how was your week. Right? Now, they're still probably going to say what we say. Fine. Fine. Why is it fine? <laughs> how's your heart? How's your soul? Why is it fine? Not just accountability questions about sin, but heart questions about brokenness. Number two, what has God been teaching you or showing you? It's a relationship you're in with Jesus. He's communicating with you. What has he been teaching you or showing you? And are you listening to Jesus and doing what he says? What's he saying? And thirdly, and so important, how can I pray for you? in the moment and through the week. How can I pray for you? Will you seek out a relationship like this? And, and, and I want to paint this picture on both sides. Invite someone to journey with you in your healing and to walk with someone in theirs. Let's pray. Oh, Father. I am so grateful, as are all my brothers and sisters here in this community, that we are fully known by a holy God and yet fully loved. We're so grateful for that. God, may we hear the voice of Jesus today saying to us, go. There's someone who needs healing. Would you journey with them? But also go, would you find someone who can journey with you? Lord, may we be like Ananias and say, yes, Lord. Amen.